want to say God bless you to all my family out there, all my Facebook family, all our family in Chicago and Texarkana, Little Rock, Sherwood, North Little Rock, El Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, all over the great United States. Thank God for allowing us to be here on tonight. Uh, tonight is our Bible class, and we will be coming out of the book of Matthew. I want to say God bless you to Brother Hall out there. I guess he had to get on the on the road. Uh, he said he was coming, but Lord willing, the night is not over. Maybe he'll be here, but we thank him, praise God that he allowed him to come home safely and sound over the dangerous highways and keeping it. We thank and praise God for the beautiful service we had uh, Easter Sunday morning. We had one to go down in Jesus' name. And we hope and pray that all is well with her. Don't see her here tonight, but we hope and pray that all is well. Uh, we know the enemy attacks when we decide to walk for God. He is still attacking. And 20-something years later, he's still attacking. But I thank God that I'm on the winning side. Well, we're going to get into the Word. Everybody say the Word. Word. Uh, I want to say welcome. Let's put our little slogan up there. The Lord gave us. I feel like he gave us. It says, let's say it together. Welcome. We are expecting our great God to do great things for us. Great power and great grace. Acts chapter 4, verse 33. Thank God for everybody being here on tonight. We do want to say welcome. You could have been to millions of other sites, but you chose Strong Tower Apostolic Ministries, and we are forever grateful. We thank God for allowing us to be up to 6,800 and some odd souls out there that have been logging in to our site. And we hope and pray that God will give us something tonight that will encourage you, that will strengthen you, that will motivate you, and help you to keep on fighting the good fight of faith. We're in a fight. We're in a war. And the war is for our souls. That's the reward. Uh, they're fighting for our soul. God fighting the devil. Amen? The devil fighting God. Jesus, so to speak. Now, I'm on the Lord's side. I don't know about you, but I've chosen which side I want to be on. And I want to be on the Lord's side. And that means I got to take up my cross and follow him. Amen? It says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The old man has passed away and all things have become new. Well, we know that's a statement of faith. God calls things as though they were. Uh, uh, how does that go? He speaks things as though they are. <laughs> Something like that. I can't get it out like I'm thinking it. But we're going to get into our word. We're coming out of Matthew chapter number 16. And uh, the Lord hadn't dropped the title in my spirit as of yet. Maybe he'll drop it a little later on and maybe not. But we're going to come out of the book of Matthew, and we made it down to verse number 14, I think it was. But we're just going to read down there again, just to set the stage for where we are. So we'll start out at verse 1 and just read to uh, our text. Starting at verse 1, it says, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, desired him that he would shoot them a sign from heaven. Verse 2, And he answered and said unto them, when it's evening, ye say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. Verse 3, And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but ye cannot discern the signs of the times. You see, I didn't make that up, calling them hypocrites. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and whoever else that Jesus called the Pharisee. Those are Jesus' words, aren't they? I did not make that up. What Jesus did tell us, though, is that we not be hypocrites. He said that our righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, meaning they were hypocrites. If they were hypocrites, that means I have to be at war with hypocrisy. Well, what do you mean be at war with hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is just pretending. Let's, let's look at the word. Did we look it up the last time? Hypocrisy. What is a hypocrite? Let's see what, what that definition is. Let's break it down. What is a hypocrite? Hypocrates. We may have looked it up before, but it slips on my mind. Psalm G, 5273. Hypocrites. Hypocrites. And it says, one who answers as an interpreter... An actor, stage player, a dissembler, a pretender, 
a hypocrite. So Jesus wants our righteousness to exceed the righteousness of a pretender. He doesn't want his children pretending to love him. He doesn't want his children pretending to praise him. He doesn't want his children pretending to be righteous. He wants us to be real. Everybody say, be real. Be real. Be real. If I'm a son of God, I'm doing the best I can to be obedient to God. That's what being real is all about. Now, we all have failures in our life. But a failure is someone who's willing to admit his fault and repent of his fault and forsake his fault and ask God to forgive him. That is what a real saint will do. There's a song that says, we all fall down. A saint is just a sinner who fell and got up again or something like that. Well, we all have uh, shortcomings in our lives. I mean, we're just, that's what we are. We're just flesh and blood. But when we're walking with Christ, he helps us to keep from falling more and more. When we're growing in him, we should be able to be getting better and better over time, like a new baby. <laughs> when he first starts walking, he falls a lot. But eventually, he gets stronger, becomes more uh, uh, agile, and he gets his balance down, and he falls less and less. Until finally, he's an old man like me. <laughs> and when you see him fall, it's uh, very rare to see a, see a fellow fall uh, from learning to walk, unless you trip on something or whatever. But you get good at it over time, don't you? So when you're walking with Christ, living this life gets, it's supposed to get easier and easier as we become closer and closer to him. It's supposed to. But, you know, we all grow at different rates. Not all babies learn. I think my oldest daughter, Courtney, she learned to walk when she was like nine or ten months old. And then Krista was about 13, 14 months old because she had to have surgery on her feet, and it took a little longer. David was about 13 months, 12 or 13 months when he learned to walk. So we all learn at different paces. We all do. And when we learn to walk, it's just like learning to walk spiritually. We need help. Now, when that baby is trying to walk, he's walking. He's not pretending, is he? He's really trying, or she's really trying. But they just don't have the coordination yet. Well, there are some things that we lack as newborn babes in the Lord that uh, we tend to, I guess, be a little weaker than the seasoned saint. But we all start at some level and we all mature at different times but that doesn't make us a hypocrite because we fall what makes us a hypocrite is pretending we never did fall <laughs> and not admitting the fact that i had trouble that's why our pastor bishop taught us to confess our sins i know when i knew i had to confess what i had done wrong it deterred a lot of my actions if I knew I had to be in his office, fess it up, telling it on myself, that's what confession really is, telling it on yourself. It helped me to mature and say, well, I don't want to be in his office telling on myself about this or telling on myself about that. Confession is, some people say confession is good to the soul. Just tell it on yourself. I was wrong. Lord, help me to do right. And when you get tired of being wrong, I guarantee you'll grow. I guarantee, because you don't, you don't want to be embarrassed every time talking about your fault. You're going to find some kind of way to get some endurance to overcome that fault. At least that's what happened for me. So the things that used to cause me to fall, I can say I truly got the victory over them now. And some of the things that caused me to fall today, I'm still working on because I'm not perfect yet. None of us are perfect. We always have room for improvement. Just like I have this little slogan about character always improving. Amen? Our character can always improve. There are some things about our character that we're working on at all times. So character, always improving. What do you think of that? Character, always improving. We should be trying to improve our character, shouldn't we? Whether you're in the church or whether you're out of the church, it doesn't matter. You should be improving your character, whether you're saved or whether you're unsaved. 
character always improving. Amen. Well, let's get back into the lesson. Just a little break there on the hip hypocrites. But Jesus called them that, not me. I didn't make that up. Verse 4, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a son, and there shall be no sign given unto you but the sign of the prophet Jonas, and he left them and departed. That goes to show you that Jesus does not hang around hypocrites. If he didn't hang around hypocrites 2,000 years ago, what makes you think that he'll hang around hypocrites today? What makes you think his spirit will dwell among hypocrisy? Now, if a person is sincere, I believe God is with them. The Holy Ghost is convicting them of their sins. But then it says that sometimes God will turn a person over to a reprobate mind. When God turns someone over to a reprobate mind, that means he's, he's departed from them. He's left them alone. He's given them completely over to the devil. The devil can, can, can possess them if he wants. If God departs. Do you know that it's God that's keeping the devil off of us and it is? Just like when we saw with Job. It was God that kept the devil from doing certain things to Job. He said, you got a hedge around about him. I can't get to him. I would have been after him a long time ago, but I couldn't get past that hedge. Well, I thank God for that hedge that he has about us. God, keep that hedge around about us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus instructed us to pray like that, didn't he? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us from the one who wants to destroy us. Deliver us from the one who wants to uh, tear us down. Deliver us from the one who wants to hate on us. Deliver us from the one who wants to, to, to be our adversary. Deliver us, O oh God. Is that all right? Jesus said, pray, lead us not into temptation. Why would we pray, Lord, lead us, and lead us to the devil? <laughs> lead us to temptation. Lead us to the one who hates us. That doesn't make sense, does it? So if God tells us to lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, that's what we should be praying. We shouldn't be seeking to hang around hypocrites. At the same time, we don't judge either. But you do know someone by their fruit. Jesus says you shall know them by their fruit. That means the things they do, the things they say, the places they go. You shall know them by their fruit. What are they putting out? Is it good fruit? Is it evil? Or is it good? Is God pleased with it? Or is man pleased with it? Who's pleased with the fruit that you're producing? Who's pleased with the fruit that I'm producing? It's my prayer every day, Lord, help me to please you. Let my words that I speak please you. I desire to please him, first of all. And that's not pretending. That's where my heart is. And sometimes when you're trying to please God, you offend man. You offend Adam, the flesh. Not intentionally, but you're trying to please God. So do you think these Pharisees and these Sadducees enjoy being called hypocrites? Do you think they were offended by that? These were highly educated, highly successful people, highly religious people. Some of them had the Bible memorized. Do you have the Bible memorized? Some of these guys had it memorized. That looked like devotion, doesn't it? And you call this person a hypocrite and they've memorized the Old Testament or the first five books of the Old Testament? Wow. He has some pretty strict I would say standards, wouldn't you say? If he called these guys hypocrite. And not only that, verse 4 says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after his son, and there shall no sign be given unto him but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. Verse 5. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the living of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Verse 7. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Verse 8. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, 
O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread. He knew what they were talking about. They thought he was talking about bread, didn't he? But he was talking about the doctrine. Verse 9. Do ye not understand, yet understand, neither remember the five loaves and the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Verse 10. Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Verse 11. How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Verse 12. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now, right there is where I stopped or got to last time. And I said, this is the doctrine of hypocrites. If he called them hypocrites earlier, can't you substitute the word hypocrite for his Pharisee and Sadducee? This is the label that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords put on him, isn't it? I didn't put that label on him. He put it on him. He also called him a wicked and adulterous generation that desires a son, seeketh after a son. I didn't say that. God said it. Jesus said it. And if he said it, it must be true because he is our future judge. Is he not? He's one to judge what's in the heart. So he's warning us to beware of the doctrine of hypocrites, pretenders, people who are pretending to love God, but they love what the benefits of God. They love the blessings. Do you know it's possible to love the blessings more than the blessor? You can fall in love with the blessings and forget about the blessor. We don't want to forget about the blessor and start worshiping the blessings. We want to thank God and give him praise for the blessings, give him honor for the blessings, give him glory for the great things he's done, for the great things he's doing. Amen. Give him the praise that he's worthy of and he'll keep the blessings flowing. But don't stop and put the blessings in front of the blesser. I've said this many times before, haven't I? Don't put the blessings in front of the blesser. Give him the praise that's due his name. All right, let's go on to the next verse. I thank God for his blessings, but I certainly keep him number one. Verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I am? The son of man am. Remember, man is Adam. Who does Adam say that I am? Who does Adam say that I am? And look at what they answered. Verse 14. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. See, there's debate. Adam is always confused. <laughs> Adam never agrees on everything. We, we're divided. We're divided as men across the world. We are divided. We don't agree on everything all the time. None of us. So when Adam, that shows you right there, there are many different interpretations that Adam has, doesn't he? Or man. Many different interpretations about who is Christ? Who is this? Oh, that's Jeremiah. Some men say. Oh, no, that's, that's Elias. Some other men say. Oh, no, he is one of them prophets. See, Adam is always in the world. That signifies the world. The world don't know who Jesus is. They don't know. Adam doesn't know. The flesh doesn't know. God has to open our eyes. Watch what he goes on to say. Verse number 15. He says, And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Who do you apostolics, future apostolics, they're still disciples right now, right? They're not apostolics. They're not Jesus' name apostolics yet. They haven't been baptized in Jesus' name. The day of Pentecost hasn't come. They haven't been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. So they're still in training, so they're called disciples at this point in time. 
whom be ye disciples? See, Ju Judas is still with them at this time. He's the treasurer. He handles the money. He loves the money. Did you all know that? Judas was the treasurer in the group. He liked the money. Now, does that say that everybody that handles the money in church has a Judas spirit? No, it doesn't. We're all individuals. We're all different. But a person who does handle the money are, have a lot of temptations they have to be careful about. Lots of temptations. And we have to pray for them. I just heard on the news well, a couple of months ago, a treasurer or a bookkeeper at one of the uh, churches over here in our area got arrested <laughs> for stealing some of the church money. But the pastor forgave her. You know, but she got arrested because what she had done was criminal, a criminal act with the money. So there are a lot of temptations that comes from handling other people's money, the Lord's money. And Judas was styled as a thief, but yet he is still with the disciples right now. And when he asked this question, whom do ye say that I am? Judas is right there. Let's see what they say. See, the world has one thing to say about Jesus, but what do we say about it? The people who are in church, the people who are following him, what is our opinion? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Wow. We take that for granted today, don't we? Well, look what Jesus said. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Wow. Peter gave the correct answer, didn't he? You're the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you're blessed. But you didn't get that on your own. My Father had to reveal it to you. Do you know that God has to reveal who Jesus is to all of us? He has to reveal himself to each and every one of us. And for me, it's through the baptism in his name and the infilling of the precious gift of the Holy Ghost. When I got God's spirit for myself, when I experienced speaking in tongues for myself, that was God revealing himself to me. And I was like, this is real. God's spirit is real. God's presence is real. This is not fake. This good spirit that I feel in my heart is real. It changed me, y'all. It made me want to give up sin. It made me want to live right. It made me want to treat everybody right. Now, am I saying that I didn't have faults and failures after that? No, I'm not saying that because I was still a baby just like anybody else. It takes time to learn to live right and live holy. We all have faults and failures. But I thank God I don't fall for the same things I used to fall for. I don't say the same things I used to say. I don't go the same places I used to go. There's been a great change in me. And I give him the praise for it. That's my testimony today. But I found him for myself. God had to reveal himself to me. God will have to reveal himself to you, Julia. You can only hear my testimony. But until you experience it for yourself, you're just taking my word at it, right? It takes God to reveal it. This is what Jesus is telling Peter. He hadn't revealed it to the world. The world don't know who Jesus is because God hasn't revealed it to him, to them. Verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Wow. Peter answered him so discreetly that the Lord gave him a a special honor that he didn't say to the other disciples, did he? He said, Peter, I'm going to build my church on that foundation that I am the son of the living God. That's the foundation of the church. Who is Jesus? 
He's King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the Son of God. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the ending. He is God manifest in the flesh. Who is Jesus? He's our Lord and our Savior. And he said, I'm going to build my rock, my church on that rock, on that foundation. Now, that goes to show you also who wrote this book that we're reading. What book are we in? Matthew. Do you know I've looked it over there now? Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. But I hadn't found any other book that mentioned Peter being the rock. The church being built on the foundation and Peter having the keys given. Matthew said that. And if Matthew said Peter had the keys, why is it that people aren't baptizing the way Peter said to baptize? A majority of the church. I won't say everybody, but a majority of the church world. They're following Matthews. Repent, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's what Matthew said. That's not what Peter said. So people are following the wrong rock. But Matthew wrote this, didn't he? Matthew wrote these words. Matthew, so we don't have an excuse. Matthew said Peter would have the keys to the kingdom. Matthew said Peter, Jesus was going to build a rock on Peter. Let's read it one more time. Verse 18. Matthew said it. And that's the only book that I found this in, unless I've overlooked it. If you find it somewhere else, show it to me. But Matthew said these words. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse 19. And I will give unto thee. Who is he talking to? I will give unto Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou, who is thou? Who is he talking to? Who is thou referring to, that pronoun referring to? Huh? And whoso, whatsoever thou shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Who is the thou referring to? Who is the thee referring to? And I will give unto thee. Who is thee? Peter. Who is thou? Huh? Peter. Who is the other thou? Peter. That is the pronoun that's been, that is the noun these pronouns are referring to. Peter. And I will give unto Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever Peter shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever Peter shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That pronoun is referring to Apostle Peter. Jesus is talking to Peter. How is it that that's been misinterpreted all over these years, and people are saying he's talking to well, whoever? In my understanding, he's talking to Peter. And I will give unto thee. Click on thee. Let's, let's see if it refers it to Peter. What does that refer to? Peter has the keys. And if somebody has the keys, mean they have the authority. What they say, we need to obey. Not worship, but obey. Soy. Strong's G, 4671. Soy. Soy. There's Mexican. Su. Su. And look at it. It's personalized. It says to you. To you. Who is the you referring to? To you, Peter. That's singular in it. That's not plural. Isn't that singular? To you, Peter. Now go back, please. And see what the thou refers to. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth. I guess you have to click on this one here. Thou shalt bind. Who is that referring to? Deal. Strong 
Psalms G 1210. Deo. Deo. Bind, tie, fasten, to bind, fasten with chains, to throw in the chains. Satan is said to bind a woman bent together by means of a demon, as his messenger taking possession of a woman and prevented her from standing upright. To bind, put under obligation of the law, duty, to be bound to one, a wife, a husband, to forbid, prohibit, declare to be illicit. To you, Peter, I gave you the authority to bind, put under obligation of the law, a duty. To you, Peter. Nobody else got that, did they? He was talking to an individual. All right, go back to the lesson, please. He was talking to an individual. Unto you, Peter. Now we can remove the pronoun and put the noun there, can't we? And I will give unto Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou, Peter, shalt bound on the earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever Peter shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Can't you replace the pronoun with the noun? Huh? Is that legal to replace the pronoun with the noun? Is it legal? You can't replace a pronoun with a noun? Daughter, come here. Or you come here. Then I say, shall come here. <laughs> I've replaced the pronoun with the noun, haven't I? And it's more specific. So this is specific. Verse 20. Then charged he, his disciples, that they should tell no man he was Jesus the Christ. It wasn't his time yet. Everything was done in timing. And it goes on to say, now remember, Matthew wrote these words, didn't he? Matthew wrote the fact that Peter had the keys. Peter had the authority. Remember, the scripture says, Jesus said, take heed of the leaven, the doctrine of the hypocrites. Watch out for the doctrine of the hypocrite. And then he gets into doctrine, doesn't he? He basically says, Peter, you have the keys to the doctrine. You have the authority. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. That gave authority, divine authority to Acts 2.38. When Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That gave divine authority to Acts 2.38. That was the key. Do you agree? I call it a combination law. Repent, <laughs> then turn to, turn to Acts 2, verse 38, right? Two to the left, three to the right, eight to the left. <laughs> a combination law. But we have to unlock that law, don't we? If we want to get into the heaven, to heaven, if this man has the keys to the kingdom, we have to go the way he said. It doesn't make him God. We certainly do not worship the Apostle Peter. I certainly, for one, can say I do not worship the Apostle Peter, but I am obedient to what he taught. It does not make you a worshiper of Peter to be obedient to what he taught, does it? I worship the Lord Jesus Christ. I worship God. Like the scripture says, worship God. Don't worship man. Well, I just wanted to throw that in. Let's finish this up. I guess I'll read it on out. My teaching time has expired. Verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes in other words, the hypocrites. Look at what I got to suffer from the hypocrites. And be killed and be raised again the third day. Well, we just celebrated that, didn't we? What did they call? Easter. Easter. We just celebrated it. Verse 23 or verse 22. Then Peter, there's the rock, took him and began to rebuke him. Can you rebuke God? Can you rebuke the Lord? Rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned. Now, he just gave Peter honor a few verses ago, didn't he? He just gave him a pat on the back, so to speak. But now Peter's, what you say, put your foot in your mouth, so to speak. 
And look what Jesus said. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Boy, he put Peter in his place, didn't he? So if Peter had made a mistake in Acts 2.38, wouldn't God have corrected him? He corrected him right here, didn't he? He certainly would have corrected him for Acts 2.38 if he had made a mistake. If he corrected him here, it shows that he would have corrected him somewhere else, wouldn't it? But he doesn't, not only accepts what Peter says in Acts 2.38, but he sends an angel to Cornelius and tells Cornelius to go to Peter. And he has the key. He has the, the way to be saved. He told him to listen to what Peter had to say through the angel. Remember that? So if he was wrong, God would have corrected him, just like he corrected him at this time. Verse 24, then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I guess that's my title, follow me. Hey, thank you, Jesus. Follow me as I follow Christ. Follow me. Amen. Who is the me in that? Who is, the, who is that pronoun referred to? Huh? Follow who? Follow Christ. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And this is what my daughter gave me on Easter. It signifies carrying your cross. It signifies carrying your cross. I don't guess they can see that on the World Wide Web. It's over here on the corner. But I'll lift it up to where they can see it. She gave me this as an Easter present. And it's a statue, a little statue here of someone carrying a cross. I guess it represents the Lord. He got a crown of thorns on his head, but he had to carry his cross. They didn't have the strength to carry it. So they had to get Simon to help him, remember? They had to beat him so bad they didn't have the strength to carry it. So he's kneeling down. But Jesus is saying right here, our future judge is saying, let us all take, deny himself, take up our cross, and follow me. Follow who? Who is the me referring to? Christ. Follow Christ. But Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So whoever you're following, make sure they're following Christ. Is a hypocrite following Christ? Or is he pretending to follow Christ? He's pretending. So when someone is pretending, don't follow them. Follow the one who's real. And you know them by their fruit. That's how you know them. That's what Jesus said, and that's what I say. Now let's read this on out. Like I say, my teaching time has expired, so we'll finish this out so I can go back into the Old Testament next week. Verse 25. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. That's a hard saying, isn't it? You mean I've got to be willing to be put to death like Christ was? To follow Christ? I've got to be willing to let them torture me to death? I've got to be willing to allow my life to be taken? That sounds like what he's saying, isn't it? Do you know the apostles did that? They allowed their lives to be taken following Christ. And many, many others did. Verse 26. For what is the prophet if he should... For what is it if, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man, every Adam, every woman, according to his works. Verse 28. Verily I say unto you, come back down here. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Isn't that beautiful? Follow me. Is that all right? Follow Christ. And he said, I give the keys 
to my heaven to Peter. I'm going to build my church on that foundation, on that rock, on the rock what Peter teaches. My church is built on Acts 2.38. We can substitute that, that verse in there, can we? Because that's what Peter taught, isn't it? Did the other disciples dispute him or did they teach the same thing? Paul baptized some in Acts chapter 19 in Jesus' name. Philip down in the Samaritans baptized them in Jesus' name. Several others baptized in Jesus' name, so they didn't dispute Peter. Peter's got the keys. So why dispute the one that Jesus gave the keys to his house? <laughs> didn't he? Didn't we read that? I'm giving the keys to Peter to my house. If you want to get in my house, you got to come through the man who got the keys. You don't worship that man, but you got to obey him. He got the keys. He's the doorkeeper. <laughs> so if you're going to go in somebody's house and they got a doorkeeper, you got to first get past the doorkeeper, don't you? Peter's sort of like the doorkeeper to the key of the kingdom of heaven. Follow me as I follow Christ. I didn't understand Acts 2 38 when I first saw it. I have been taught Matthew 28 19. Be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. I didn't realize that that was a combination of Jesus' name. Jesus is the Father in creation. Jesus is the Son in redemption. Jesus is the Holy Ghost in the church. The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in every three are one. It's just one God. Amen. He's just one God, and I love him today. I thank him for salvation. Follow me as I follow Christ, or simply follow Christ. Amen. If Christ gave the keys to somebody, respect Christ. If you don't respect the man he gave the keys to, are you really respecting Christ? I don't respect Peter. He was just a fisherman. I respect the tax collector. Matthew, he was more educated. He was a tax collector. <laughs> well, men have been disputing who Jesus was all throughout history. When he was on earth, they were disputing who he was, weren't they? Will that ever stop? It's only going to stop when God stops it. But as for me and my house, I've chosen to follow Christ and go through Acts 2.38. That's what I've decided to follow. I've been baptized in Jesus' name, and I have no regrets. I love that name. And anybody I baptize in the future, it'll be in Jesus' name. As long as I got this mind that I have now, it'll be in Jesus' name. I love it with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. And we thank you all for logging in tonight. We hope and pray. We have to talk doctrine tonight. Because Jesus said, beware of the doctrine of the hypocrites. Beware of their doctrine. Talking about the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the scribes, those who wanted to kill Jesus. I'm not calling anybody a, a, a hypocrite today, but if the shoe fits, you know what they say? You got to wear it. If you're pretending, you got you to gotta wear it. <laughs> but I'm not going to be a pretender. I'm real. I want to say I love you by the grace of God. And I hope and pray that something's been said tonight. They'll encourage you to want to follow Christ. That is our title tonight. Follow Christ. Respect the doorkeeper he put in front of, he gave the keys to. Respect the, door key, the doorkeeper of his house, which is heaven. He gave Peter a lot of responsibility, didn't he? And I respect Christ, and I respect what he did through Peter. Precious Father, we thank you for allowing us to preach and teach your word on tonight. We hope and pray that somebody will understand your word and will be obedient to your word and will be gladly baptized in your name. We pray according to your will right now. Help us to beware of the doctrine of Pharisees and Sadducees and, as you put it, the hypocrites. Help us to beware of the doctrine of the hypocrites, that we, O oh God, not follow doctrines of hypocrites those who pretend to love you but don't love you oh god you know the heart of every man let my heart be real 
and let the heart of those who are hearing me on tonight and whenever they hear it be real we pray according to your will right now we love you we honor you and we adore you in jesus name amen and amen now may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you may the lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in jesus name god bless you